My name is Nathan, and I'm here for some help and advice. I haven't left my house in nearly a week, and I'm at risk of losing my job and possibly my life. Most of you will discount what I'm about to say, and to be honest, so would I. Well, that was before last week. Truth is often stranger than fiction, and in this case, it certainly is. This is some messed up story time. So, please, listen to what I'm about to tell you, and if someone out there has any answers, reach out to me before it's too late. Last Friday, I joined some colleagues for a quiz night at a local bar. Honestly, we did more shots than we got correct answers. At 10.30pm, I decided to leave. I wasn't drunk, just slightly tipsy. I didn't live far, so I started to wander back home. Around five minutes into my ten-minute journey, it started to rain. There had been a storm forecast, but it hit earlier than expected. I held my jacket over me while seeking a shortcut through an alleyway up ahead. As I was about to go through, my pace slowed as I realised someone had crossed the road further down the street. It was an older woman, possibly in her late forties or fifties. She seemed as eager as me to get home, running down the road in my direction. She then began to cry out, her voice echoing in the rainy night, while her head glanced back over her shoulder. It looked as though she was being chased, but I couldn't see anyone behind her. Should I help her or hide? I thought to myself, but the small possibility of danger entered my mind. I cautiously slipped into the alley, peeking slowly around the corner. I noticed in the illuminated rays of the streetlights a dark silhouette carved into the rain. The looming figure was moving in on her. I closed my eyes briefly, my breath caught in my throat, while the rhythmic sound of raindrops sounded out around me. I quickly reopened my eyes just as the woman toppled and crashed to the waterlogged ground below, with a shriek and a splattering thud. Time seemed to slow as the thin layer of water leading up to the helpless woman began dancing upwards in a pulsing rhythm. The flickering water drew closer as she attempted to scramble to her feet. Then the splashing footsteps stopped. She moved her head from side to side, trying to locate the stalking predator. But nothing. Just an eerie silence filled the empty street. Only the blanket noise of raindrops could be heard. She stumbled forward, legs trembling, now stood underneath one of the street lights. The glowing beam exposed her bloodied face. The figure reappeared out of nothing, like a light-absorbing vortex distorted by the rain. It was stood right behind her. A dripping blade made from water began to form at the end of a shadowy arm. She must have sensed it by the way her body jerked quickly around, now face to face with that thing. The watery blade plunged deep into her gasping mouth. Her horrific screams turned into a gargle in an instant. Her eyes widened as she looked straight at me, the life draining from her now limp body. The woman then dropped to the glistening concrete in a heap as water settled around her. I turned, my right foot slipped as I tried to sprint off through the narrow stone-enclosed alleyway. I had no idea what that thing was or how it killed that poor woman, but I wasn't going to hang around to find out. I didn't stop running till I reached my front door. I dipped my hand frantically into my left jeans pocket, pulled out my set of keys. They fumbled in my hand as I concentrated on finding the right key. Why I had all of these keys on there, when I only know what half of them are for, I really don't know. Once I had found the right one, the next challenge was trying to get my arm to stop shaking so I could get in. I forced the key in, unlocked it, and burst through the door. 
I slammed it so hard behind me the surrounding wall trembled. I was stood, hunched over, hands on my knees and head down. My breath deep and quivering as my eyes watered in fear. I felt sick in that moment, like I had just been punched in the stomach. After five minutes, I had started to regain some normal breathing again, enough to lift myself up and walk to the living room. I sat, exhausted on the chair, just as a bang came from the wall. It was obviously my neighbour, probably moving something around, but I jumped out of my skin regardless. For the rest of the night I had all of the lights on, and TV on full volume. I couldn't sleep. The image of that woman, losing her life right in front of me, was playing on repeat in my mind. I must have finally managed to fall asleep around 4 or 5 a.m. I woke up in a confused state, positioned awkwardly on my sofa. The sunlight streamed through a gap in my blinds, hitting half of my face. Eyes squinted. I looked for the TV remote. It must have turned itself off overnight. Once I had found it, I switched it on. A banner ran across the bottom of the news channel on the screen. It read, Woman found dead in street of small town. I have not disclosed the town in question out of respect for the woman's family. I pulled out my phone to search on the internet for the article. The information was vague at the moment, but a quick search on social media gave me more details. As the weekend went on, the story settled into a probable cause of death. The woman had passed out and landed face first into a large puddle where she unfortunately drowned. Only I knew what really happened. I couldn't go to the police. Who would have believed me? If anything, I would have been classed as a suspect. Sunday evening had set in and I looked curiously at the week's weather forecast. It seemed that Friday's downpour was just the start. A great storm was supposed to hit tomorrow and last the full week. I had convinced myself that I couldn't have seen that figure in the rain. It was probably me hallucinating in my tipsy state, but seeing that forecast made me feel anxious and dread the morning. I tossed and turned until I eventually drifted off to sleep. My night was long and full of nightmares. I must have woken up seven or eight times gasping for air, covered in my own sweat. Morning finally came, and as I was getting ready for work, raindrops cascaded down my bedroom window. I opened my front door to leave around 7 a.m. The sun was only just starting to rise in the miserable dawn twilight. I put my jacket hood over my head and hurried to the car, the wind whipping mists of rain into my face. I took a deep breath to compose myself before setting off. I drove the ten-minute journey to the office, the wind and rain battering my windscreen. I felt relieved when I pulled into the office car park. I got out of the car and pulled the hood back over my head. As I walked towards the glass door of the office, I heard a small splash behind me. Naturally, I thought it was a colleague, but I couldn't see around my hood. I turned my body round to look, but the car park was empty. I couldn't see anyone in their cars either. I continued walking towards the door, and the splattering started again. It was like someone walking behind, following me. It was clear these were footsteps. I walked faster into a jog as the splashes mirrored my pace. I finally reached the building and I got through the door just in time. The glass behind me was cloaked in a wave of water that dripped into a small puddle below. My day at work was probably the quickest I had experienced in my life. Time appeared to fast forward. Five o'clock came. A nervous lump formed at the back of my throat. I walked outside with a few of my co-workers. Luckily, the rain had stopped. As I headed back home, there was nothing out of the ordinary. I even started to feel calm. 
I got back home, put the TV on, and stuck some pasta in the microwave. Later that evening, while I drifted off to sleep, I started to hear running water from my kitchen. I leapt up and tentatively walked towards the kitchen doorway. Every step into the darkness felt like a descent into the unknown. I felt for the switch and flicked it on. Water flowed into my sink of its own accord. I rushed over to turn it off. All of my senses now heightened. I turned back towards the door and crept to the bottom of my staircase. Paranoia was now clearly getting the better of me. I peered up, seeing if anyone was up there, and I called up. Hello, is someone up there? Of course, nothing answered me. I knew deep down I was alone in the house. Maybe my lack of sleep was catching up with me, I thought. I turned the TV and lights off, then headed upstairs to go to sleep. I brushed my teeth and began to get into bed. The wind rattled the half a dozen trees outside my bedroom window as rain began to patter on the glass. Just the sound of rain was causing me anxiety, so I put on my headphones and listened to music to try to mask the ongoing storm. I laid down, eyes wide my brain on overload, thinking about every tiny detail of the last few days. I cursed to myself as I remembered that I hadn't locked the front door. I went down the stairs and double locked it. Just as I turned to walk back to bed, a crash of water hit the door. Small water droplets began to run down the inside of the door frame. I sprinted upstairs pulled open my curtains to look out onto the street below. I expected to see flooding or a water mains leak, but nothing. It was barely even raining at this point. I really thought I was losing the plot. I shuffled back to my bedroom when I heard my shower running in the ensuite. Panic set in. My heart rate grew faster and my breath deeper. As steam seeped out of the cracks between the frame and the door, I put my quivering hand on the handle. I slowly pushed it down and pulled the door towards me. The hinges creaked as I was hit by a warm mist coming from the darkness. I pulled on the light cord. The bright spotlights lit the room. Through the steam, I could see a figure stood in the shower cubicle. A chill ran through my body. I froze in shock. I physically couldn't move. I used all of my strength to approach the cubicle and yank the door open. No one was there. Well, not that I could see. I slowly backed away as within the cascades of water, a silhouette began to emerge. The faint sounds of water droplets hitting an unseen body splattered towards me. Its water-lined arm started to raise as liquid rushed towards the end of it. I picked up a glass and threw it at the evil entity, trying to get it to leave. The glass shattered on the tiled wall behind, sending shards flying throughout the shower. I had to get out of there. I ran out the door, closed it behind me, and pushed my drawer unit in front. I burst out of my room and down the stairs, my hurried feet slipping as I went down. As I got into the kitchen, the water began to flow from the tap again. I flung open the cupboard underneath and twisted the water shut-off valve. A gurgling noise proceeded as the water above me started to reduce into a slow drip. I sat trying to regain my breath on the cold tiled floor. I didn't see any way out of this for me. I couldn't and still can't make sense of what was stalking me. This ominous man-like figure using water as a weapon. After what seemed like hours, I got myself off the floor and sat in my living room. I can't lie, dark thoughts ran through my messed up head. How I wasn't going to let that thing take me out, even if I had to take myself out of this dire situation. Morning came sooner than I thought. I had been sat up all night. My head racked with fear. I didn't dare go back upstairs. 
I called in sick for work, as I just couldn't move knowing the rain was still battering down outside. Every so often, I would hear a large splash of water on one of my windows. First, it would be the living room one. Then, the kitchen window was drenched in a wave of water. About 11 o'clock, I decided I was going to go upstairs. I nervously walked up each step. I was anticipating the worst from what I had experienced the night before. I pushed the bedroom door open, holding my breath, trying to listen for any slight noise. As I neared the ensuite bathroom, I could see that the drawer unit was pushed out at an angle, and the door was now open. This was the same door I had slammed shut and blocked 12 hours prior. Goosebumps suddenly covered my body as my heart frantically lashed at my ribcage. My breath was forced out in short bursts as I prepared myself to enter the bathroom. One large exhale later, I burst the door open. It was empty. The shower was still wet and the shards of glass still covered the bottom. As I looked down at the tiled floor, five large watery footprints led towards the door. The hairs on the back of my neck began to stand on end as I slowly looked around. The curtains were soaked in water and the window was ajar. It looked like it had made it out of the house. I fell to the bed in relief, hoping this was the last I would see of it. I have since only been out once in the last four days to get food and stock up on small bottles of water. I have still not had the courage to turn the water back on. I have no plans to do so until I get some answers. The storms keep passing through and I venture outside between the downpours. I constantly feel like I'm being watched and the pipes have been making strange noises ever since that awful night. I am now desperate for some suggestions or solutions to all of this. I don't know how long I can put up with all this. I just hope somebody will take this seriously. I hope to update you all soon. Wish me luck. When I was fresh out of high school, I was in a bit of family drama. I needed a temporary place to stay and had to find a quick job to support myself. I had the ambition to push myself through college and ended up in a bad spot. I barely slept, I had no social life, and I couldn't find the time to do the most basic stuff. I didn't have time to cook, so I basically lived on takeout. The only place I could find within my price range was a refurbished storage space. It was basically just a bed and a couple of shelves with partial access to a bathroom. It wasn't really meant as a living space, but the landlord didn't care. There wasn't even wallpaper, unless you consider some actual vines in the corner to be wallpaper. But this is where I get to teach you something. Storage spaces are built very differently from ordinary living spaces and apartments. They're not isolated the same way, and this space was lined with something nasty. My immune system was crashing hard from months of vitamin deficiency and unhealthy habits, and in combination with an awful living situation, I got a bad infection. Like, really bad. My throat got so swollen that it looked like I'd swallowed a whole apple. I could barely breathe. I got one of the worst fevers of my life and I had no insurance. I ended up crawling back to my parents. It was humiliating. We'd had our falling out, but when they could see how bad things had gotten, they helped me out. I was immediately taken to a doctor and put on antibiotics, but the swelling had gotten so bad that they suspected permanent nerve damage. Once the swelling died down, it turned out the doctor was right. Trying to speak was like touching a live wire. It was so painful that it could make me black out. 
it eventually got a bit better. I could start to make noises without immediate pain, like laughing and coughing, but trying to form words tickled something in my throat. Moving my vocal cords too much caused the pain to flare back up. My doctor said it would probably never heal completely, but in a couple of months, at most a year or two, I'd get part of my voice back. Maybe. But yeah, for all intents and purposes, I was mute. It was difficult to cope with at first. I began to carry a laminated card, basically saying I'm mute. It is easy to forget the many ways we use verbal communication in our day to day. Ordering at the fast food place, answering questions in class, turning down salesmen at the door. It's usually the things you don't think too much about. But having that barrier, no matter how small, can really turn the mundane into a chore. It just becomes too bothersome to explain the same thing several times a day. I started to socially isolate myself more. It was hard to be around other people. Forget about going to a party. There's no one patient enough to wait for you to type stuff out on your phone. My parents helped me find a better place to live in, and I managed to find a job closer to my new home. Nothing fancy, just stocking groceries at one of the corner shops. A couple of months passed, and I started to get used to a new life and routine. I knew there'd come a day when my voice returned. But for now, even attempting to speak made me nauseous. A loud yawn could send me spiralling if I wasn't cautious. Then one morning I got a phone call. I'd been up late the previous night and didn't think too much about it. Out of reflex, I pushed to answer the call, held it up to my ear and opened my mouth to speak. In the last possible moment, I stopped myself, only pushing out a hoarse breath. If I'd tried to actually say something, I'd have ruined the rest of the day. So imagine my surprise when another voice came out of me. Good morning, it said. I dropped my phone and slammed my hands over my mouth in shock. I saw the call end and just sat there in silence, trying to calm down. That wasn't my voice. Those weren't my words. What the hell? I took some time to collect myself. Checking my phone, turns out that was just a robocall. Some automated crap trying to make me answer a survey. I stood in front of my bathroom mirror for a good ten minutes, opening and closing my mouth, trying to see if I could make that voice come out again. I thought it might have been some kind of trick or a sign of recovery. Maybe I just didn't recognise my own voice. No matter what I tried, as soon as I even tried to formulate a word, my throat burned like I'd been cut by something sharp. There was just no way I could have said anything without noticing it, even pretending to speak and testing my limits caused a burning sensation, forcing me to put on a bit of eucalyptus balm. I went on with my day, but that moment kept coming back to me. It wasn't imagined, but it wasn't me either. At one point I thought it might have come from the phone, but that didn't make sense to me. The simple fact was that it came from me, somehow. I got back home from my shift, had a hot shower, and parked myself in front of a Netflix show. That show about social media people tricking one another. I have a soft spot for reality shows. It was this big dramatical reveal of a member of the team getting kicked off at the end of the episode, and I audibly gasped, almost choking on my takeout ramen. Then it happened again. A light tickle at the bottom of my throat and the voice came back. Scandalous, it muttered, all without my lips moving. I felt it much clearer now. It wasn't me forming those words. They were coming up from my throat on their own. My mouth was wide open. I wasn't shaping any vowels or consonants. I just sat there for a moment, my heart skipping a beat. 
I was scared to move, as if that might prompt it to reappear. I remember wondering over and over what the hell it was. And finally, I mouthed a silent question. Are you still there? And to that, a vocal answer crept back up, slithering out of me. Yes. I stood up and wandered about the room. A hundred questions went through my mind, but none of them were answered. My thoughts had to linger on that final yes and the implications. There was me, and there was a you. Something different from me, using me. Even then and there, in the comfort of my own space, I felt watched. As I went to bed that night, I had trouble relaxing. I had this recurring thought that whatever was resting inside of me was just waiting for a chance to do something. It felt sinister, a presence forced upon me. I probably scrolled through my socials for at least an hour and a half before I fell asleep with the screen still facing me. Somewhere in the black of the night, I woke up. It wasn't sudden, just my eyes slowly opening. The sun hadn't broken through my window yet, and I could tell I'd only been asleep for a couple hours. There were no cars going by on the streets outside, and no neighbours stomping around. But there was a noise. It took me a couple of seconds to realise that it was coming from me. A hushed voice, whispering into the dark. It was barely audible, but it was coming from my mouth. I tried to look down, but all I could see was my shivering upper lip. You have been given so many gifts, I caught it saying. To spoil and squander and wither, idle children feasting on crumbs of gold. Mother, unbirth me, find me unwanting, undeserving, unsullied. When I finally realised what was going on, I shot out of bed and sprinted to the bathroom. I was frustrated and scared to the point that I wanted to scream and cry. But all that came out were these weird hulking noises. And with every awkward breath, I could hear something in the space between. No. Awful. Grim. Finally, I just snapped. I forced myself to scream. Even at my greatest effort, it wasn't loud, but it was enough. Little specks of blood spattered on the wall. The scream triggered such an intense shock of pain that it left me squirming on the bathroom floor, gasping for air. I have no idea how long it took for me to regain my composure. Wiping my tears, I bent over the toilet seat and spat up a glob of blood and dislodged scar tissue. I stayed in the shower for over half an hour, just waiting for the bleeding to stop. I'd set my recovery back weeks, maybe months. But hey, at least the voice was gone. Perhaps it needed some part of me to speak, a part that I'd damaged. I had a few spots of blood on my pillow the next day. I'd barely slept. Still, I dragged myself to work. I tried my best to keep out of the spotlight, get a quick nap on my lunch hour and keep to myself. I didn't want to try and explain what I was experiencing. I had tried to type out a message for my parents but there was no way they wouldn't overreact. They would probably think I was on drugs or suffering some kind of schizophrenia. They always assumed I was at fault for whatever ailed me. That was their go-to response. They couldn't accept that sometimes things were just out of my control. I gave up after the sixth draft. I couldn't find the right words. As my shift ended, I made my way home. My favourite takeout place was packed with people from some kind of work outing, so I had to shoulder my way forward to the counter. Maggots. The word just fell out of me, whispered into the ear of some random passerby. I saw them turn around to look my way, but they didn't say anything. The look he gave me 
was the first actual proof that this wasn't just my imagination. This was a real, physical thing. And the look he gave me was nothing short of disgust and confusion. I forced my mouth shut, but it didn't help. I could feel the air push out of my nose as another sentence reverberated in my mouth. Damn them all. I stopped a few feet from the counter as I took notice of people turning my way. I tried to hold it back, holding my breath, but little puffs of air made my cheeks expand like a chipmunk. When I finally let go, it was just a non-stop barrage of word salad pouring out of me. Not loud, but not quiet. Just enough to make me look like a blathering madman. I turned to leave. A worried 40-something office worker tried to touch my shoulder and ask if I was okay. But the voice in me snapped back. I'll suck the skin off your knuckles, it hissed. As I left, I looked back one final time. About half a dozen worried faces looked back at me. Faces turned from curious to wide-eyed bewilderment. As I stepped away into the dark, the voice made itself known one last time. Yes, leave. Make us lonesome. Coming back home, I positioned myself in front of my mirror. I didn't even take my coat off. I just took out my phone held it up and opened my mouth. I wasn't going to let it use me. I wanted it on camera. I needed something to prove I wasn't delusional. I tried to coax it to ask it questions in my head. I tried to make it come forward, but nothing seemed to work. I must have stood there for a good half hour until my jaw started hurting. Not a single peep or noise. It was just me staring at my own teeth in silence. I was so goddamn frustrated. I wanted to scream and shout, but I couldn't. I ended up throwing the mug with my toothbrush across the room, shattering it against the hallway wall. All I managed to get out was a couple of grunts, and even that burned my throat like I was licking a welding torch. Leaving the bathroom, I kneeled to scoop up the mug pieces. As soon as my knees touched the floor, a gleeful little whisper escaped me. I won't dance to your tune, puppet, it chuckled. Stay on your knees. I bit my tongue. I was so frustrated I could cry. That night, as I lay down to sleep, I could feel the voice just inches away. There was a little push in my stomach every time it was about to speak and I felt that push all night long. It was always just a breath away, but the words didn't come. But as I finally closed my eyes and yawned, it returned. You need to submit. I gently shook my head, rustling my hair against the pillow. You have to. And again, I shook my head. The tension in my chest remained but nothing more came out. I hugged a pillow, made myself comfortable, and tried not to think about it. Moments later, it came back with a vengeance. My lungs pushed themselves empty, and a cramp crept up my spine. I rolled onto my back and felt my stomach force itself upward. My mouth opened, and I had this dreadful feeling. It felt like being trapped under ice, desperate for air. For a moment, nothing happened. I just hung there, my body tense and out of control. Then a scream. It resembled a woman being murdered. Scream, after scream, after scream. Begging for help, squealing in pain, crying. I couldn't stop it. I forced myself to roll over to try and block it with a pillow, but it didn't help. It was so loud that my ears rung. I scrambled out of bed, still feeling this constant flow of screams pushing its way out of me. Trying to hold my breath just built up this unbearable pressure, like my lungs were going to explode. 
I didn't even know what I was looking for. I dug through kitchen drawers, spilling forks and knives onto the floor. I tried stuffing a dish towel into my mouth just to dampen the noise, but it was useless. There was nothing I could do or say. It was going to continue no matter what. Finally, there was a knock on the door. A few final pleas for help escaped me as two police officers burst through the door. In that moment, the voice stopped. They had a hard time believing that those screams came from me. First of all, I'm a man. The voice was clearly female. Second of all, I couldn't talk. They found the laminated I'm mute note in the hallway. There was no way they could believe a mute man could make that kind of noise. Then again, they couldn't find a victim either. Confused, they had me get dressed and took me down to the station. The process was surprisingly quick, rushed even. They said they were holding me until they could find out what the hell had happened, but they refused to get me something to type on, not even my phone. There was no way for me to explain what was going on, and as a result, I just had to wait it out. I spent the night in a holding cell, expecting every breath to taunt me. I shared that cell with another person. I have no idea what he was in for, but he had the look of someone who wasn't afraid to get violent. Something about his eyes said he was itching for a fight. He was easily 6'4", and his leg kept twitching. I tried to avoid eye contact, but as the hours passed, he was getting antsy. When he finally locked eyes on me, I knew it was going down. Stop staring at me, he said. I'll rip your fucking eyes out. I looked away, but he didn't care. He was pacing back and forth, trying to provoke me goading me into a reaction, calling me all kinds of awful names, accusing me of being something I wasn't and doing something I didn't. Little bitch, he'd say. You like sitting there checking me out, huh? Think you can take me? I couldn't say anything, and that tingle inside me didn't either. I just sat there. But as he escalated, it quickly got physical. As he grabbed me by the collar and pulled me to my feet, I could feel his sour breath on my face. Who's to say I don't put you the fuck down, huh? He said. Get you before you get me. Maybe it needed me alive. Maybe it didn't want to see me beaten and bruised. Maybe it was a matter of control. Two alpha creatures clashing, trying to outmaneuver one another. Either way, as I stared into this man's eyes, I felt something move. The words flowed out of me like venomous silk. A new voice, but from the same source as every other cursed word that I'd had forced upon me, nestled deep in the core of my stomach. Why'd your brother stop crying, Simon? He immediately let go, and his eyes went wide. His mouth hung open, like he'd forgotten how to breathe. Simon, it continued. Simon, where is your brother? He backed away, his lips shivering. His hands retreated to his chest, like he was subconsciously hugging himself. Simon, you're scaring me, the voice pleaded. Simon, please. I've never seen a man this terrified before. There was no way to tell what he was going to do as he was forced into this primal flight or fight reaction. He pushed himself against the door and just started bawling. Slowly, it escalated into a horrified scream, this shrieking, childlike primate scream. He was unravelling in front of me, clawing to get away. A chuckle escaped me and it grew into a laugh. I tried shaking my head, pointing at my throat, but nothing helped. For all intents and purposes, it was me doing it. There was no comfort in saying it wasn't. 
Not that I could if I wanted to. He was taken to another holding cell, and I spent the rest of my night alone, curled up in a corner, quiet. Somewhere in the space between sleep and dream, I heard it again. I can't remember the exact words, but I remember what it tried to tell me, that it could be a friend, a great ally. It just needed me to acknowledge my position. I was a vessel, an honored and appreciated vessel, but no less, an object, something likened to a king's crown or a bejeweled scepter. But I was to make no mistake. This thing, this being, could do perfectly fine without me. It could thrive, and it could make my life a living hell for as long as it wanted to for as long as it needed to. I drifted in and out of sleep, tossing between struggling to keep my eyes closed to deep in a fever-like dream state. At one point, I remember forcing my eyes open to get out of a nightmare, only to see the entire room half flooded with water, dead flower petals bobbing up and down beneath the cold black waves reaching all the way up to the edge of my sleep-paralyzed lips. On the other side of the room was a person wrapped in black algae, shivering. It didn't speak, but I knew what it sounded like. It knew that I knew, and that made it smile. Early the next morning, I was released. There was no reason to hold me, as there was no victim. They didn't have an explanation, and I couldn't give them one. They concluded that it simply couldn't have been me, and if somehow it was, there was no victim. There was no crime. Walking home, I was in a daze. I was exhausted and broken. I didn't even notice the voice still talking to me. The whispers were kinder, little wishes reaching my ears, small, sensible things to go home and change, to have a proper breakfast, to brush my teeth. Things I would have done anyway. But doing what it asked, well, it felt right, good, even. I couldn't be bothered to care anymore. I couldn't stop it. I couldn't fight it. There was no strength left in me, and I didn't want to live in that world of pain and constant conflict. It was so much easier to just say yes. And for some time, that's what I did. I barely remember what I did. I'd do absurd internet searches for obscure articles relating to anything from large investment groups to agricultural practices of growing sunflowers. I'd spend hours scrolling through profiles and pictures, making little notes with numbers that I didn't know the meaning of. It all felt like an improvised dance, making little movements just for the sake of a stray thought. It wasn't inherently malicious. But every now and then, there'd be something I didn't want to do. To follow a stranger home and make note of where they lived. To note which bus someone would take on their way home from work. To ask someone's name, only to look it up online later. Something in me was forcing me to map out people their actions and their routines. Not just any people, but specific ones. They seemed to have little in common, but the voice was adamant. And every time I hesitated or said no, I knew I was in for a world of hurt. It wouldn't take much for me to change my mind. A little chuckle, a sigh, a knowing purr. One night, I found myself staring at my reflection in the bathroom mirror. I was wearing a black cap and sunglasses, and I came to the realization that I had no idea what I was doing. When had I even bought that cap? Did I have a new jacket? Something had snapped me out of my daze, and I didn't even realize what or why. I looked down at my leather-clad gloves, I had some kind of rope in my pocket. I was about to go out and do something, but I didn't know what. 
I'd shaved my head and trimmed my eyebrows. I had these heavy bags under my eyes, as if I hadn't slept for days. I'd lost a lot of weight, and my cheeks had lost a bit of their rosy vigour. On the side of the bathroom mirror was a tiny speck of dry blood. It occurred to me that it was from that very first night when I had challenged the voice, when I had forced it quiet with a scream of my own. It was a stark reminder of just how much pain it took to shut that thing up, even temporarily. But looking at myself as I was, I was starting to come to terms with just what it would take for me to resume a normal life and to stop whatever the hell I was about to do. I can hear your doubt, it whispered. Tools don't doubt. The words brushed against my lips escaping into the room. It left some condensation on the bathroom mirror. I wiped away the speck of blood, looking at it on the top of my finger. We have work to do, the voice continued. Come now. I shook my head. I knew I was going to regret it, but I didn't want to do this anymore. I didn't know what it was making me do and the realisation that I had no idea where my life even was anymore felt like ice running up my spine. I'd lost control. I'd handed over the reins. How long had it been? Weeks? Months? What had it made me do? I shook my head again, mouthing a quiet no. My body tensed as my jaw was forced open. I could hear a laughter bubbling up from inside. It was pleased. It wanted me in distress, and it made no secret of it. I thought back on that first night. I'd screamed so bad that i damaged my throat. But no matter how painful it was, it had accomplished one thing. It had made that damn thing shut up. I grunted. I could feel an uncomfortable poke at the vocal cords, but that was it. I grunted again, louder, I forced a groan through my throat, and this time it started to burn, like swallowing boiling water. No, it whispered. This will not do. With a twitch of a neck muscle, it slammed my head into the bathroom mirror. It felt like blinking, but when my eyes opened, I was standing on an unfamiliar street. It had moved me. Something warm was running down my forehead, partially dry. I was clutching a knife, slowly making my way through an alleyway. This time, I forced myself to growl, rattling my vocal cords. It felt like being slowly chainsawed, but I could tell it wasn't just me that it hurt. My knees buckled and I fell forward, dropping the knife. When I got up, I had moved again. I was somewhere off the highway, walking towards a car that had pulled over for me. Maybe they'd mistaken me for a hitchhiker. I turned the other way, trying to wave them off, as I steeled myself for my greatest effort yet. I knew it was going to be painful, maybe the most pain I'd felt so far. The thought of it made my eyes tear up, but maybe it'd be enough for that thing to finally shut up for good. I got down on all fours by the side of the road and just screamed. I screamed repeatedly and I could feel the pain tearing through me like a hot knife. A stray thought cried out that maybe this was for nothing, but I couldn't bear it. I had to believe that this was going to work. I kept screaming over and over. The coughs bubbled up and as I spat my blood on the asphalt, I could feel something tickling my throat. Pointless, it whispered. Useless. It was playing on my doubts, but I could hear that it was weaker. It was lying, convincing itself. Finally, I could feel something come loose, something tangible and physical. I spat out what looked like a small vine covered in tiny petals. It was probably blue, but the blood made it look black. With every cough, 
I lost more control, but I could feel more and more dislodge. Vines, petals, some kind of shelled seed, and even a blooming flower. Something resembling a twisted organic sunflower with little Z-shaped petals, no bigger than a thumb. It was still moving, raw and bloodied like a newborn mouse. I was just lying there on the side of the road. The bleeding wouldn't stop. I could feel my pulse all the way up to my teeth. I was desperately crying for help, but there were no words, no screams, nothing. But at least there was no voice left in the back of my throat. I only have vague memories of what happened next. The blood loss was pretty severe. They had to perform some kind of surgery. The next thing I can clearly remember is looking up at the hospital ceiling, feeling a comforting warmth in my left hand. My father, holding my hand, patiently waiting for me to wake up. The doctor explained how I would probably never talk again, that it would take several screenings and checkups over the course of several months just to keep my throat from rupturing that I wouldn't be able to eat solid food for a long time. There were technical terms, projections, hopes and fears, but the greatest problem to me was already solved. That thing was gone. Whatever had lived in me had been ripped out by the roots and I was in control. I was finally back in total, actual control. Now, this was a couple of years ago and I don't like to look back on it. Even mentioning it makes people look at me funny. Most of my immediate family think it was a psychotic episode. I've become that family member that you have to be a bit careful around, it seems. I'm hoping it will fade in time. I'm not sure where that thing came from. I think it might have lived in that storage space as some kind of spore. Maybe it was something I ate. Whatever it was, it wasn't just this metaphysical manifestation, it was an actual physical obstacle. I think the longer it had time to dig its roots in, the worse the loss of control got. I think that thing was bad enough to touch nerves that I didn't even know I had. Thinking back on that night where I finally ripped it out makes me cold. Yes, it was an amazing relief, but the pain was otherworldly. But as far as things go, I'm me. I may not have a voice anymore, but actions speak louder than words anyway. I figured that, by writing this down, I could stop myself from forgetting that this really happened. Looking back at it feels almost like another life, like something that happened to someone else. But it was as real as real gets, and I don't want to imagine what would have happened if I hadn't done as I did. But sometimes I wonder, if my voice were to fully recover, who's to say that it won't come back? What if there's some kernel of it living deep in the pit of my stomach? Who's to say I'm not still whispering things in the dead of night? I thought I'd seen everything, but I had no idea what I was going to see in this body. In my work, the rule is always to be meticulous and to study every organ, every inch of the body. An oversight, and you could miss something crucial to understanding the cause of death. When Detective Mike Dalen called me in the middle of the night to perform an autopsy on this body, I thought it would be just another procedure but I was terribly wrong. Mike, was it really necessary to wake me up in the middle of the night for this? It's 2 a.m., the body's not going anywhere. I told him as we entered the autopsy room where he was already with the body. Sorry, Jack, Chief's orders, he said, massaging the back of his neck. I looked at the body lying on the table. A man, white, in his thirties, bald, 
about 5.9 feet tall. I could see several fresh bullet wounds on his torso. I couldn't figure out why, but something was bothering me at the sight of these wounds. He was shot just a few hours ago by two of our guys, but I'll fill you in later. The most important thing is that you examine the body for now, Mike told me. I remained thoughtful for a few seconds. The wind and rain were pounding hard against the windows, and the light was flickering from the growing storm outside. Mike, come on. I can feel that there is something weird here. You never would have called me in the middle of the night if there wasn't something going on. He seemed to hesitate. Look, take care of the body. It may be nothing. I hope so anyway. He sighed. If you notice anything or need me, I'm right here in the hall. What? You're going to stay there throughout the autopsy? I asked with surprise. Yeah, just a precautionary measure. The chief wants a report as soon as possible, he said, while staring at the body. I was puzzled, but there was a body on my autopsy table, and I saw nothing else to do but get to work and discover the answers myself. The storm outside had picked up, but the lighting remained steady enough to examine it. I donned my equipment and set to work. The first thing to do was to drain the body of its blood. Problem? Either there wasn't a single drop left, or my equipment wasn't working. After checking, I thought he had indeed bled to death somehow and decided to make the incision in his torso to work him over completely. As I stood over the body, scalpel in hand, I felt something strange. As if I were about to commit a transgression, a fault. As if something was waiting for me inside that body and once I'd opened it, I'd never be able to go back. As I stared at the man's belly, I thought I saw him blink. I immediately snapped out of my torpor and stared at his face, my heart rate jumping all at once. What are you hiding from me? I whispered. It might sound odd, but speaking aloud would sometimes ease the tension in the room when I came across a particularly banged up body. But conversely, this one seemed in a very good state. Precisely. A little too good when I thought about it. Although the colour of the body was strangely dull, and as I observed the colour of his skin, I swore I saw out of the corner of my eye his gaze turn to me and instantly return to its place. I gasped again and pulled away. I took a deep breath. It was past midnight. I'd been awakened after a long day at work and I hadn't even had time for a cup of coffee. That, coupled with the storm and Mike's strange behaviour, was probably putting my imagination into overdrive. You've got to get a grip, man. You've been doing this too long to believe in the undead now. I stepped back in front of the body and raised the scalpel in front of me. I closed my eyes for a second and made the Y incision. I reached the end of its lower abdomen and finished opening the body with the necessary tools. Every passing second seemed surreal. I could feel that something was wrong. And when I looked inside his body, I understood why. There was nothing there. Not nothing in the sense of nothing wrong. Nothing in the sense that the body was entirely empty. The light bulb above my head flickered. What the hell? Still dubious, I grabbed a flashlight and shone it inside. I got my face as close as I could and shone the light in all directions. There was absolutely nothing, no organs, not even a trace of blood. I straightened up and stormed out of the autopsy room. Mike, is this a joke? He gasped in surprise as I yelled at him. Wow, Jake, what's going on? Come see what's going on. He followed me in seed, and I indicated the body with my hand. He looked inside, 
and unspeakable fear crossed his face. Then he began to stare inside and seemed lost in thought, as if looking for an answer to a question I didn't know. Drops of sweat appeared on his face. After a moment, he looked up at me. I'm sorry, Jake. I didn't tell you everything. I joined him over the reclining body. Now's a good time, then. What the hell is this? A cop joke? How did you even manage to pull this off seriously? It's no joke, Jake. He took a long breath to calm himself. I didn't lie to you about the apparent cause of death. Two of our guys shot him after he tried to attack them last night. They responded to a call from a woman who seemed in absolute panic and was talking about a man or something, chasing her to the edge of the woods. Mike stared at the floor with a defeated expression on his face. They managed to intervene, but too late. He had already ripped the poor woman open and seemed to be digging inside her with his hands when they found him. He tried to attack them, and they opened fire. He looked at me again. The thing is, when the paramedics arrived, they saw right away that there was something wrong with the body. They said it felt like they'd lifted a dummy instead of a man. It seemed hollow. And on that last word, he stared at the body again. Holy shit, Mike. And you didn't think it was a good thing to tell me about this before. I didn't want to influence you. After all, they could have made a mistake too. I looked silently at the body on the autopsy table. It definitely gave off something artificial, as if animated by something other than common human biology. Wait, I said suddenly, staring at the body as if I were actually seeing it for the first time. You're telling me that that thing was shot by bullets? Yeah. I turned my head toward Mike. This thing isn't bleeding, and it doesn't have any internal organs. So how can you be sure it's dead? And with that, as if it had been listening to us since we walked into the room, the body on the table began to shake. We were both in a state of stupefaction, watching this body come back to life before our very eyes. This empty body without organs, without anything that should make it live. A moment later, the thing calmly straightened up and sat down on the autopsy table, torso still open. Its eyes fell on me, then on Mike. The light kept flickering above us, and in an artificial voice, devoid of any emotion, it said those words I'd never forget. Thank you very much. Now, I'm certain of what I was missing. It leapt forward, and Mike stepped between it and me. He didn't have time to draw his gun, and a struggle ensued, but it was a lose-lose for Mike. This thing was incredibly strong and agile, contrary to what its empty shell suggested. In less than a minute, Mike was inert on the ground, his lifeless eyes darting in my direction. The body straightened up and began to lean towards me. I closed my eyes and put my arms in front of me to protect myself. I waited for a few seconds that seemed like an eternity and when I finally opened my eyes, expecting to come face to face with this thing, I realized that I was alone in the room. Mike's body had disappeared with it, leaving a pool of blood as the only evidence of what had happened. Droplets splashed on my face, and I noticed the window was open. It had fled with Mike's body. I stood there for a few minutes, trying to process what had just happened. I closed the window and called the police about what had happened just a few minutes ago. But I think it's my responsibility to warn you. I don't know what it is, but that thing is out there, and now it has everything it needs to look just like us.
20 years is a long time to live with an awful secret. And it's worse when it's a secret you can't share with anyone else. Not only because you're afraid of how they will judge you, but because they'll probably think you're insane. I know if someone else experienced what I experienced when I was 14 and told me, I'd think they were nuts. That is, if I hadn't experienced it myself, I never told anyone, not the police, not my family, not the families of Dylan and Greg and Zach and Terry, not even the therapist I see regularly, to deal with the lingering guilt and trauma. I think she suspects I'm holding back, that I know more than I'm letting on, and she prods me, encouraging me to get it out. She tells me that it'd be beneficial to come clean and put it out in the open. But I just can't. No human being in their right mind would believe such a story. But I want to get it out there somehow, to someone. I want to unload the burden I've been carrying all these years. That's why I'm posting it here anonymously, on Reddit No Sleep. I want to tell others the truth about what happened, to me and my friends on Halloween 2003. I don't care what you think of me after you read it. Judge me or call me crazy all you want. I just want an impersonal audience to know the truth and give me their opinion. I think that would make me feel better. Me and my best friends Dylan and Greg were in eighth grade that fall. We had been friends since we were seven. Middle school is that awkward transitional stage between grade school and high school, where you start to shift away from being a kid and start to mature towards adulthood. Even though we would be starting high school in just another year, in many ways we were closer to 12-year-olds rather than teenagers in terms of maturity. I'm telling you that so you have some understanding of why we did what we did that night. Terry was the new kid in school, a shy, geeky kid who, even by middle school standards, was pretty awkward. He was desperate to fit in, to make friends and be accepted by his peers. I guess that's why we took advantage of him. Please, try to understand. We didn't consider ourselves to be bullies. We never intended for anyone to get hurt. We just wanted to scare him, that's all. We weren't intentionally trying to be cruel. It was just supposed to be a dumb prank. We were stupid kids, and stupid kids do stupid things. It was mostly Dylan's idea, but me and Greg went along with it. In hindsight, I wish to God we hadn't. But how the fuck were we supposed to know? How could anyone know that what we did that night was going to result in so much horror and bloodshed? Dylan told Terry that if he wanted to hang out with us, he had to pass an initiation first. To become part of our group, first he had to spend a night in the old Magruder house, alone. And being late October and Halloween fast approaching, that was the perfect night for Terry to take the dare. The old Magruder house in question was an abandoned old wreck that stood at the edge of a cornfield on the outskirts of town. A rotting, decrepit two-storey house that had been deserted for as long as anyone could remember. We didn't even know who the original owner had been. Magruder was just a name Dylan made up for dramatic effect. The three of us had explored the house before and even though its outward appearance was admittedly pretty creepy, peeling paint, broken windows, sagging roof, inside it was truthfully rather nondescript and unthreatening. Just empty rooms with tattered wallpaper and dusty old furniture. I could tell Terry was apprehensive, maybe even a bit scared, but he swallowed his reservations and accepted Dylan's challenge. He just wanted to make friends that badly. That's one of the things that haunts me the most. October 31st was a chilly, windy night when the four of us, me, Dylan, Greg and Terry, rode our bikes out to the old house. We met at Greg's house, 
telling our parents we were spending the night to watch horror movies. Greg's parents both worked nights and wouldn't notice we weren't there. When we arrived at the abandoned house, we dismounted our bikes and just stood for a few moments, staring. None of us had ever been out here at night and it looked ten times creepier than it did during the day. The decayed facade almost resembled a face. The dark windows, empty eye sockets. The front doorway, a gaping black mouth. A cold autumn breeze rustled through the bare trees that surrounded the house, rattling their skeletal branches. I shivered and pulled up the zipper on my jacket. I glanced at Terry and saw him gulp nervously as he took in the sight. He was trembling slightly, and not just from the breeze. He was scared. We hadn't even entered yet, and the poor kid already looked like he was about to jump out of his skin. I felt a flash of guilt because I knew what Dylan had planned. Dylan took off the backpack he had brought along, rummaged inside, and brought out three flashlights and a battery-powered lantern. He kept the latter for himself and passed out the former to me, Greg and Terry. Without a word, he gestured for us to follow him, then started towards the house. I exchanged a slightly uneasy glance with Greg. I think he was also feeling bad, knowing what we had in store for Terry. Then we went after Dylan, Terry trailing hesitantly behind us. Dylan stepped through the doorway and disappeared from view, but we could see the glow of his lantern inside. Me and Greg paused for a second just outside the doorway, Terry behind us. We exchanged another nervous look, then passed through the threshold into the abandoned house. Dylan was standing in the middle of what had once been the living room, waiting for us lantern in hand. Me, Greg and Terry looked around the place, shining our flashlights around. There was a huge stone fireplace in the room, some old splintered chairs and the remains of what had probably once been a sofa or a couch, but was now only a heap of crumbling termite-eaten wood and rotted, mildewed upholstery. Apart from a thick coating of dust, and a heap of dried leaves that had blown in through the front door. The living room was empty. Dylan sat down on the floor and motioned for us to do the same. We did, sitting in a semicircle like kids at a campfire, gathered to hear a ghost story, which was exactly what happened next. Dylan proceeded to tell us the lurid, blood-curdling history of the house and its prior residents, the Magruders, According to Dylan, back in the 1950s, the house had been owned by a widowed old man named Magruder, who lived there with his adult daughter. Magruder was an outcast, who was seldom seen, only coming into town once a month to buy supplies. He was rumoured to be an evil man who cruelly mistreated his daughter, who he never allowed to leave the house. Because he never attended church, there were even rumours he was a devil worshipper and practised satanic rites. Several young children disappeared from the town. They suspected Magruder was somehow responsible, but with no evidence they couldn't arrest him. After a while, people noticed that Magruder hadn't made his regular once-a-month trip to the general store to stock up on groceries. In fact, no one in town had seen Magruder in well over a month. A group of townspeople went to his house to investigate. There, they made a gruesome discovery. Old man Magruder and his daughter were both dead, their bodies torn to pieces and scattered throughout the house. The sheriff later said it looked like they had been torn apart by wild animals. Their bodies were covered with claw marks, and they had been partially eaten. Supposedly, when they went down into the basement, they had found a pentagram drawn on the floor with blood, old witchcraft books, and a pile of charred bones belonging to the missing children. They never solved the murders, but the town suspected that Magruder must have been performing a satanic ritual, and somehow something had gone wrong. 
Perhaps he had summoned a demon that had killed him and his daughter. The house stood empty for more than five years, but then a new family moved into town and bought it because it was so cheap. The townspeople tried to warn them about the house and its horrifying past, but they just laughed them off. They were from the city and they didn't believe in stupid superstitions. They had scored a great deal on the place and they weren't going to be scared off by a bunch of ignorant hicks. A month passed uneventfully, but then the family just disappeared. They weren't murdered, there were no bodies, they were just gone. Vanished without a trace, no signs of foul play. All their possessions were still in the house and their car was still parked outside. It was as if they had just disappeared off the face of the earth. After that, no one would dare live in the house. It just stood vacant for decades, slowly falling into ruin. I need to stress that Dylan's whole story was total bullshit. Everything he told us was pulled straight from his arse, made up specifically for Terry's benefit, and it had the desired effect. As Dylan told his story, Terry's eyes got wider and wider with fearful wonder and dread. He bought it hook, line and sinker. Poor guy was just too trusting. Me and Greg both knew Dylan's story was fake, but we played along, pretending to be equally freaked out. Dylan fell silent, a grim, thoughtful look on his face. He glanced at his watch and announced that it was 20 minutes till midnight. He handed Terry his lantern and told him he had to remain inside the house until dawn. By himself, the three of us would be waiting outside to make sure he didn't try to cheat and sneak away. If he lasted until 7am, he could consider himself to be part of the group. We stood up, wished him good luck, then left the house one by one. I was the last to leave. I looked back at Terry just once. He stood there, trembling, scared shitless, but with a look of almost pitiful determination on his face. I remember him like that, frightened but resolved to prove his bravery to us, because it was the last time I ever saw him alive. I joined Dylan and Greg outside, and we returned to where we'd parked our bikes. As soon as we were far enough away, Dylan and Greg's grave expressions broke and they both began to snicker. Dylan fished around in his jacket pocket and removed a small battery-powered receiver. It belonged to a baby monitor Dylan had bought at the local mall a couple days back. The transmitter was hidden inside the old house. You see, what we had neglected to tell Terry was that we had managed to rope Greg's older brother, Zach, who was 16, into dressing up in a pretty impressive demon costume, complete with a realistic latex mask, and hiding in one of the abandoned house's upstairs rooms an hour before we had shown up. He was waiting up there now. In exactly 20 minutes, at midnight, Zack was going to start making some scary noises, subtle at first, shuffling footsteps and creaking floorboards. If Terry was brave enough to go up and investigate, Zack would jump out and ambush him there. If he wasn't, then in another 10 minutes, at 12.10, Zack was going to move up to making terrifying groaning sounds and demonic growls. There he was going to gradually descend the stairs to confront Terry in the living room. We would hear Terry's horrified reaction over the receiver, just before he fled the house in a panic, probably screaming at the top of his lungs as he did so. Yeah, it was a mean prank, but we were just teenagers. And to make it up to Terry, we had agreed we would let him be friends with us afterwards, if he was still interested. We waited there, listening to the receiver as the minutes slowly crept by. We could hear slight shuffling sounds, probably Terry moving around in the living room. Maybe he was pacing to kill time, waiting for dawn to come. Then he started humming what I think was an Avril Lavigne song. This caused Dylan and Greg to snicker again. 
I looked at my watch. 11.55. Five more minutes. We listened. Suddenly we heard Terry's voice through the receiver's speaker. Hello? He said uncertainly. Is someone there? Dylan quickly raised his finger to his lips and motioned for silence. This was it. We listened intently. Hello? Terry said again nervously. Is someone down there? I saw Dylan frown slightly, confused. Is someone down there? The noises were supposed to be coming from upstairs, where Zack was hiding. But Terry was apparently reacting to something he was hearing in the basement. Hello, Terry said a third time. His voice was fainter, as if he had moved further away from the hidden transmitter to see what was making whatever sound he was hearing. We listened, waiting for what came next. Silence for about a minute. Then we heard a piercing scream, coming simultaneously from the receiver in Dylan's hand and the house itself. A high, warbling cry of absolute terror. It cut off abruptly. For several seconds, there was total silence. Then all three of us flinched as a hideous roar emanated from the receiver. A nerve-shattering, bestial bellow of pure, unearthly rage. It was a sound that froze the blood in my veins, primal and completely inhuman. The receiver fell silent. The three of us looked at each other, shuddering, our eyes wide with shock. We turned to face the house. We stood there, silently, waiting for Terry to appear in the doorway. He didn't. Minutes passed, but there was no sign of him, or of Greg's brother Zack. We called out their names, but there was no answer. Dread seized my heart with a cold, clutching hand. Dread and fear. Dylan was close to panicking. He wanted us to get the hell out right then and there, to get back on our bikes and ride home as fast as we could. But Greg angrily refused to leave. Terry might be hurt. Maybe there was a wild animal in there that had attacked him. And besides, his brother was still in there too. We had to help them. Greg was right too. We couldn't just leave them in there. With a great deal of reluctance, the three of us headed back to the house. We reasoned that maybe Terry had somehow found out we were setting him up for a prank. Maybe he had turned the tables and was trying to prank us in return. I'm not sure if any of us believe that though. We entered the living room and aimed our flashlights around, calling out Terry and Zack's names. There was no sign of them. We listened, but there was nothing but silence. But I did notice something. The house smelled different. When we had been in there earlier, it had been the unpleasant, but not unusual, musty, dusty odour you'd associate with long-abandoned homes a combination of dry rot, mildew, mould, and the dank smell of decaying wood. Those smells were still there, but now they'd been overlaid with an entirely different smell, something that was hard to describe. The rank, feral odour, organic and savage, of something alive. It was like something you'd smell in a zoo, the smell of a predator's den and the air felt different too. It felt heavier and oppressive. There was something here that didn't belong here. I had never been more terrified in my life as I was right then. Every nerve in my body was screaming at me to retreat, to flee. I might have done so in another few seconds, but then Dylan called out, uh, what's that? Me and Greg looked over. He was staring through the kitchen doorway, shining his light at something on the floor. We joined him and saw what the beam of his flashlight was focused upon. On the cracked, grimy, ancient linoleum was the lantern Dylan had given to Terry. It was lying on its side, smashed to pieces. A few feet beyond it, at the other end of the kitchen, 
stood a black, gaping square of blackness. A doorway, a doorway leading to the basement. I think all three of us were getting ready to bolt when a voice spoke from the darkness beyond the basement door. Please, please help me. It was Terry's voice, pleading in a weak, painful groan. Please help me. I'm hurt and I can't see. It's dark down here. Terry? Dylan stammered. What happened to you? There was a monster. It attacked me. I fell down the stairs. I think I broke my leg. Please, guys, help me. In spite of my horror and dismay, I felt a small measure of relief. I began to understand what must have happened. Zack had surprised Terry in his costume, and Terry had panicked and gone the wrong way trying to flee from the house. He had run into the kitchen instead of going out the front door and fallen down the basement stairs. Zack must have panicked himself when he realised what had happened and had slipped out through the rear of the house. Shit, Dylan whispered to me and Greg. We're in trouble. Then he called down to Terry. OK, hang on, man. We're coming down to get you. Dylan pointed his flashlight down into the basement and began to descend the stairs, Greg right behind him. I started to follow them. But then I spotted something. An old refrigerator stood beside the basement door. The refrigerator door was slightly ajar, and something was leaking out of it, dripping steadily into a growing red puddle on the floor. Feeling suddenly very cold, my heart beginning to beat faster, I stepped closer, aiming my light on the red puddle below the refrigerator. Distantly, I heard Dylan's voice from down below. They must have reached the bottom of the basement stairs. Where the hell is he? Seemingly in slow motion, I reached out a numb hand and grasped the refrigerator's handle, pulling the door all the way open. Terry! Greg's voice called out from the basement. Where are you? Terry's mutilated, blood-splattered corpse was crammed grotesquely inside the refrigerator. His glazed eyes seemed to stare dully at me, accusingly. Terry? Dylan called out doubtfully. I lunged at the basement door, shouting down at my friends. Dylan, Greg, get out! Get out of there now! It's not Terry! It... Before I could finish, I heard three piercing screams in quick succession. The first two, short, the third longer. The first scream might have been of shock, the second was probably of terror, but the third, protracted scream was unquestionably one of agony. Dylan. Dylan's dying, agonised scream died to silence, but Greg quickly picked up the chorus, screaming my name, screaming for help. Standing in the basement doorway at the top of the stairs, too scared to go to his aid, I shone my light down in the direction of Greg's screaming voice. I saw my friend backed up in the corner, trapped, his eyes bulging and wild with horror, facing something. Something that was approaching him. I only glimpsed it, but that one brief glimpse was enough. More than enough. Enough to imprint itself like a brand upon my scarred psyche, to haunt me in untold nightmares to come for the rest of my life. It wasn't human. I don't think it ever had been. It was tall and slumped, and horribly out of proportion. Its head about three feet above its torso, perched on a thin elongated neck like a giraffe's. Its long, spindly arms extended at least six feet from its shoulders. Its skeletal hands were tipped with long, bloody claws. It appeared to be naked, and its skin was a hideous mottled grey, like the skin of a corpse. It had its back to me, so at least I didn't see its face, which I am eternally grateful for. If I had, I don't know if I would have kept my sanity. As the thing moved in for the kill, Greg, cornered, looked up 
locking eyes with me. Help me, he shrieked. But I didn't. Instead, I ran like a coward, abandoning him to his fate. I ran out of that house, back to my bike, and pedalled away as fast as I could. Greg's dying scream chased after me until it abruptly stopped. Weeping, I rode back to Greg's house. I called 911. The police came. They went to investigate the house. Greg's older brother, Zach, was found dead in one of the bedrooms upstairs, his head torn off his shoulders. Terry was still in the refrigerator where I had discovered him. What was left of Dylan and Greg's bodies were scattered throughout the basement. They had been ripped apart. The cops questioned me, of course, demanding to know what we had been doing there in the first place. I finally admitted to the prank we had staged on poor Terry, but didn't tell them about the creature I had seen in the basement, as traumatised as I was. I knew they wouldn't believe me. I simply told them someone else had been in the house, a squatter maybe, some deranged psychopath who had attacked me and my friends, with me being the only one to escape. I told them it was dark and I hadn't gotten a good look at the assailant. They were suspicious of my story. They must have sensed that I was holding something back. It crossed my mind that they might even suspect I had killed them myself, but no one ever accused me outright. There wasn't a drop of blood on me, and I was obviously distressed and shaken over what had happened. The investigation lasted for weeks. Forensic teams scoured the house for any physical evidence, but never found anything useful, and the murders were never solved. Not long after, my parents moved me away to a new town for a fresh start. I went on with my life, trying to move past what happened that terrible Halloween night when I was 14. But I never got over the horror and the guilt. For the rest of my teens, into my early 20s, I went through a very difficult, self-destructive phase. I dropped out of school shortly after the start of my sophomore year in high school, got mixed up in drugs and alcohol, got arrested more than once, got kicked out by my parents, was homeless for a while, and finally went into rehab and got straightened out. I'm married now, with two children and a semi-decent job in a warehouse. Things are going pretty well for me right now. But I still dwell upon what happened that night. Everything Dylan told Terry was fake. There was no old man named Magruder, no devil worshipping or child sacrifices or demons or murders. It was all made up. It makes me wonder. I think about the power of suggestion, the placebo effect. The story Dylan told wasn't real, but I could tell Terry believed it. Maybe belief was the key. Maybe Terry was so frightened by what he heard, he somehow unwillingly, unconsciously willed it all into reality. They say faith can move mountains. Maybe that's true, but maybe it also means fear can give nightmares flesh. Maybe all the monsters we were all scared of when we were kids were more real than we thought they were. I've been thinking about that a lot lately, especially after what I heard on the news a few days ago. You see, that old abandoned house isn't there anymore. About 10 years ago, a developer bought up all that land and built an apartment complex there. The police are investigating a brutal mass murder. The residents of the three lower units were all killed during the night, massacred, they have no leads. The police can't even figure out how the killer gained entry. All three apartments were locked from the inside. I think whatever horror we accidentally conjured that night 20 years ago is still there. <laughs>